So I am not actually part of the LSSC project. I am co-chair for the LSSC Solar System Science Collaboration. So this is about a 90-member group of people who have data rights um, and that are working towards doing solar system science with LSSC. So you can be a member if you're a researcher in the U.S. and Chile, for example, or who have data rights, or you don't have to. But the idea is that the, the Solar System Science Collaboration is really trying to to organize the, the effort of the community and find ways of you know, making sure to advocate that LSST will be able to do amazing solution science. So we are 90 member uh, collaboration right now. We have different uh, working groups uh, with our different leads. So just to give you a sample, you know, there, just even with that, there's lots of um, different working groups because there's so much science we think we can do with LSST. Um, so LSST is the Large Synaptic Survey Telescope. I only have 15 minutes, so I can't go too much into background. But it's a wide field survey going to 24 and a half magnitude in R, covering at least 18,000 square degrees and covering all, likely will be covering all of the ecliptic. So LSST is unprecedented in terms of it'll be the largest and deepest wide field survey for solar system objects in the next decade. So it really is coming. Hans operations start in 2022. So this is a photo taken a few months ago at the summit of Pixar Um it's now a thing. It, the telescope is being shipped, uh, be, being deconstructed and shipped to Chile. You know, the next three years are really the time to prepare for this data deluge that's coming. So I know in the past we sort of talked about LSST was more of a concept, but the coding chamber is now at the site. So you know, the things that you know, the pieces are being put together. The commissioning will be happening in a year and a half. We'll start doing some commissioning. So we really are at the point where we need to start thinking about doing science being ready on day one when this turns on at the end of 2022. So what is the expected LSST yield? It's going to be orders of magnitude more objects than we know now and are able to use now in our research. And so that's going to transform the way we do our science from having, for me as a someone who does solar system, we go from knowing about 3,000 Kuiper belt objects to 40,000 scattered disk objects. I don't know how to comprehend what I can do with that yet. But having 40,000 gets us into answering really interesting questions. Uh, for main belt asteroids, there's going to be over 5 million asteroids that will be discovered, characterized. And this is what's getting UGRIZ Y photometry. So there will be average colors for all of these objects. Um, as well as orbits. Um, so we'll be getting light curves, average colors, and uh, dynamical properties. So for interstellar objects is another example. So we have Oumuamua from PANSTARS. There will be one in a year is a pessimistic estimate for LSST to find at new interstellar objects. And again, it's going to 24 and a half magnitude, so we should be able to detect these things sooner than when was discovered uh, by PANSTARS. So what is LSST's project providing? They're providing the astrometry, the photometry, and the orbit with some help from the Minor Planet Center. So there's a link to a, web, uh, a data sheet on the bottom of my slide. You can go to that. It has much more details. So the idea is that every 60 seconds in the alert stream, if they can identify it's a moving object or it's already known moving object, it should be sent out in the alert stream every 60 seconds after the observation is taken with the information about the object. If not, and it's a new object, it will be eventually part of the daily orbit catalog that will be updated as images are being processed through the moving object pipeline. So as part of this, um, the objects will be sent to the Minor Planet Center and orbits will be fit and come back. And so this process will include having orbits, astrometry, and photometry. Um, what can LSST do for finding uh, for, for solar system bodies and small bodies? It's going to find new targets for future NASA missions. An example of Lucy, so this is a, uh, from a research note that I wrote with Mark Gui and Hal Levison, just pointing out that, um, especially in the L5 cloud of the, of the Jupiter Trojans, uh, there's not that many targets right now that Lucy will go to, but LSST, even in the main wide field survey, could potentially find uh, targets for, for Lucy to go to after the Jekyll's encounter. So this is just pointing out that this is one way that it, LSST will help uh, future NASA assets. Uh, by finding more small bodies to be able to go to for current missions that are being planned and ones that are planned in the future. What else can it do? Well, it's going to explore the origin of the Sedna and those objects that are detached from Neptune. There's proposed alignment of these distant detached uh, minor bodies that potentially suggests uh, the existence of Planet Nine. There is some still debate in the community about whether Planet Nine exists, 
But LSST is going to get hundreds of these detached objects to be able to do statistics with a single survey to identify whether or not Planet 9 or the hint of Planet 9 is there in these orbits. Also, Planet 9 should be bright enough based on Bagatine and Brown's predictions that LSST should find it if no other survey does. So what else can it do? It's going to be explore the origin of main belt comets and active asteroids. There's a hint of seeing that for objects in the asteroid belt that have sublimation-driven uh, activity, uh, that it seems to be that their orbits are aligned uh, with Jupiter. There's only a hand, maybe 15 or so, main belt comets. But LSST is going to be able to at least double that number, if not more. What can LSST for, do for Trojans and uh, looking at proplanetesimal disks? Just an example is with LSST, you're going to find hundreds and potentially thousands of Neptune Trojans with average colors. And so there's already a, a debate in the literature about whether or not there's nature versus nurture over the color of Neptune Trojans that are in place during Neptune migration. Um, and right now there's one very red uh, Neptune Trojan that's at high inclination and the rest of them we discovered are neutral. And so one argument is whether or not that's from where its location is and there's something collisionally going on that's making objects more neutral that are low inclination or whether or not this is something to do with the structure of the planet has one bit. So LSST should be able to answer this by being able to sample more of the L4 cloud. And the L5 cloud that's actually in the galactic plane, LSST with difference imaging will be able to do much better than we've done previously. So uh, again, more samples of objects, things we can do with having such large samples and average colors we couldn't do before. Well, interstellar objects, I think everyone knows about Oumuamua and what we've done with the, the data sets from around the world using all um, ground-based and uh, space-based sort of observatories. And so the same thing can be done for any one of the interstellar objects that LSST will be able to discover. So pessimistic view is one a year. Um, and again, hopefully we'll be able to then transition to be getting light curves and uh, near infrared and optical astrometry and, and photometry to be able to, to uh, characterize these more and compare to what we know about our small body samples and how we study them here in our own solar system with these visitors that are coming by. So that's really, you know, in a nutshell, some of the things that LSST can do that aren't any of um, And the Solar System Science Collaboration is focusing on doing science with LSST that is, it includes any of but also all of these other things and more. So I could spend an hour talking about all the different science cases for LSST. And so you can find what we think as a collaboration's prior science priorities are in this roadmap. So we published this last year on, on the archives. And you can go there and see what we are ranking as our highest priority science goals for each one of these different groups and uh, near asteroids, asteroids, and, and inner solar system, outer solar system, um, et cetera. So what do we do with this science roadmap? And what we're doing is we're trying to go from, these are the things that we think are most important that LSST will be unique at getting to actually getting those results and those data Products. And so LS, we have identified with a software development uh, roadmap, the science software roadmap that we've been working on, what things the community needs to build that are not going to be built by LSST projects that we're going to need to be doing this interesting science. So we're working on this, this uh, software roadmap that should be submitted to the AAS research notes at the uh, uh, end of February. And this is really telling the community what we think are the highest priority tasks that when LSST turns on in 2022, the community should have ready to go to apply to LSST data so that we're ready to handle the data deluge. And what things we need afterwards that are maybe less, not, not as important to have right away, but it's still crucial to be able to do that science. Um, so for more general details, you can go and learn more about LSST and all the things I can't talk about on our website. So that's a great place to get information on the moving object pipeline for LSST, as well as what we're doing as a science collaboration. So I want to focus just in the last few minutes that I have on what we need as a community. So we have the science roadmap and we have the software roadmap we've been, we're almost ready to, to, to release. What things are in it? So LSST is providing moving object detections out to about 200 AU in distance. Beyond that, the motion, beyond that, uh, the pipeline is not necessarily designed to find those objects. We might not see the motion between the two images taken out on a single night with LSST. So somebody else is gonna have to write to that very distant moving object pipeline. Um, also, understanding and characterizing interstellar uh, discoveries with LSST. Someone's got to go and get the data and process that data coming from these other resources to understand these objects. We need to develop a survey simulator so that we can compare orbital populations that tell us about Neptune migration or the origin of, of Sedna and potentially Planet 9 and compare that to what we've detected with LSST. 
Well, I understand where the where water is coming from and its main belt on Earth and whether main belt comets played a role, but you're again going to want to be able to explore the links between these with uh, debiasing uh, theoretical populations. All of this requires effort from the community to build these things. And so the next three years are really crucial to be able to plan and prepare for LSST for small body observations. And this is the time we can maximize the yield if we're ready to go. Um, and there's funding, et cetera, to be able to do this. So I want to comment and just say that currently when we polled the SSC, we found that uh, our collaboration, at least 75% of the collaboration is not funded to do anything on LSST. Everything that they're contributing is basically on their free time to, to participate in, in getting ready for LSST and advocating for cadences that are important for solar system work. So one thing I want to suggest is that uh, one way that NASA can help with this potentially is housing a, a series of small body workshops focused on dis uh, discussions about ground-based follow-up of LSST discoveries and other related preparatory work. An example of that is last year we were able to hold a solar system readiness sprint in Seattle, Washington, which is one of the hosts of, of the LSST data management group. And so out of that workshop, just enough funding to get people in the room and snacks to get people together, we got eight LSST cadence optimization white papers that are arguing about um, and advocating for cadences that are going to be favorable and important to getting key solar system science. We completed a proposal to change LSST uh, solar system database schema to everything that we think as a collaboration and community we need to be able to do uh, LSST science. Um, and that is now going to be going through data management review and change um, at the end of February, early March. We have a, the software roadmap also came out of this. And now we have a group of people that are interested in also understand how to use LSST data and, and, and in terms of the, the software and simulation framework that we have now. So I just want to end with saying, you know, I think one of the things is, as a science collaboration and being the representative for them here in this meeting is to suggest that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a three year window to really get up to speed and as a community and ready to go to harvest and harness the potential of LSST for solar system science. And so I'm at recommending and, ad and suggesting that the SBAG consider advocating that the Planetary Science Division add some kind of language to the 2020 and 2021 Roses call for PDAR, solar system observations, et cetera, to really encourage LSST preparatory work so the community can get engaged and funded to be able to do all the things that are needed to be able to harness LSST data. And I think that's one avenue where ROSES and NASA can play a very significant role uh, as well. So with that, I'll, I'll answer any questions anyone has. Okay, question in the room or online? Are there more workshops planned? Trying to, so I need to get funding for that. Um, we have a workshop that's partially funded for uh, July at the Adler Planetarium, but our, right now we've got funding basically to provide um, some coffee. So we'll be able to get people there if they have their own funding to be able to get there. I've applied through, um, tried to apply for some funding to be able to get some travel support, especially for early career people. Um, beyond that, um, we will see. So. Other questions? All right, thank you, man. Oh, actually, I, oh. Sorry, I do have a quick one. Um, the SBAG obviously is the most uh, relevant to the stuff you're talking about, um, but given that OPAG has some interest in KBO, have you thought about also asking them to advocate along with SBAG? So Andy's question is whether we thought about advocating to OPAG as well as SBAG. Um, OPAG has been on, on, in my thoughts. Um, we figured this is the first venue and feedback to get feedback, uh, to get before moving on to other groups since this is really the one that deals with small bodies. Um, and also, you know, and this, um, I think um, it's, it's not you know it's not the only place I think to think about uh, funding and that this isn't just a NASA thing or an NSF thing. I think it's finding resources through a community and what's the best way. So I think it's a definitely a more a nuanced conversation. So I hope this is the one